Corner Fringe Ministries presents a 12-part series on the divine nature of God. Please enjoy the study. Um, we are in part 9 of our divine nature of God study. And this week, we're going to continue to look at more evidence that proves that Yeshua is divine in nature. That He is both Lord and God. Why? Because He is one with God. Echad. You can't get to the Son without the Father. And you cannot get to the Father without the Son. It is a perfect circle relationship. They are perfectly unified in every way. They are Echad. Now that being said, let me be clear. Even though Judeo-Christianity, even though we believe that Yeshua is divine, we also make another confession. And that is that Yeshua was a man. We call him deity, but at the same time, we also state that he came in the flesh. He was manifest in the flesh as a man. And understand, this is where the tensions begin to erupt. The very concept of Yeshua being both divine and yet man, it is problematic. It's problematic for our Muslim friends who in fact confess Jesus existed. You'll find uh, Jesus in the Quran. Our Unitarian friends, it's problematic. And even for our beloved brothers and sisters in Orthodox Judaism, it is problematic. And all of these faiths, they will come out with a vengeance to condemn such beliefs that Yeshua is divine for the very sole purpose that we confess that he was a man. I mean, that's the argument. How do you reconcile Yeshua being a man and yet God? Especially when Scripture tells us that God is not a man. In 1 Samuel 15, we, we discover it literally says God is not a man. And in Numbers 23, we read, God is not a man, that he should lie, nor a son of man, that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? So passages like 1 Samuel 15, passages like this one in Numbers 23, they're passages that a Unitarian or even an Orthodox Jew, they're going to take you to. And what they're going to show you is that you are in error. You are missing it. You don't know Scripture if you actually believe that Yeshua is divine because God cannot be a man. So how do we respond to this? How should we respond to this argument? I think for starters, it's important to identify with what they're saying. In other words, there is an element of agreement here that we should have with them, with the statement that God is not a man. If a Unitarian was to approach you and show you these passages, the first thing that should come out of your mouth is, Brother, I agree with you. God is not a man. Because man is imperfect. God is perfect. Man fails. God never fails. Man is limited. God is unlimited. Man is flesh, but God is spirit. Man is mortal. God is immortal. God is not a man. Let's be clear on that. However, we should follow up with the statement that this doesn't preclude, it doesn't limit God in any way from coming into his own creation and manifesting himself as a man for the very purpose of his people, to redeem his people from bondage. Now, the Apostle Paul, in a spectacular fashion, he articulates how all of this works. Yeshua being divine and, and yet manifest in the flesh. And this really, this passage in Philippians, this is, this is going to be the basis of today's message. So, Philippians chapter 2, and we'll begin in verse 4. Paul says, Let each of you look out, uh, look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Messiah Yeshua, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Now, two statements are made here right off the bat, at the beginning of verse 6, and they're very important. The first being, Paul states, who being in the form of God. Paul literally identifies Yeshua as the very nature of, or the very image of God. In, in the Greek, morphe, it's literally the form of God. This is why we find uh, Yeshua in John chapter 14 saying to Philip, Philip, if you've seen me, 
you've seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? In other words, you've seen me, you've seen God, right? Now, Paul goes on to say, and it's, it's, Paul is setting the stage here. It's very important. The first thing that he does in going to detail who Yeshua is, is he draws out his deistic nature. It's the first thing. Now he goes on to say, and did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. What a profound statement. Did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. And I want you to understand, this is a very good translation. That word equal in Greek is isos. It, it means equal. That's exactly what it means. Some translations will translate it as the following. Did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, such as the New American Standard. That's how it renders it. Well, this, this, whole, this whole profound statement of being in the morphe of God and not considering it robbery to be equal with God, this is the very thing that got Yeshua in trouble to begin with. John chapter 5, the Jews wanted to kill him because of this very statement. He said God was his father, thus making himself equal with God. They wanted to kill him for this very statement. And yet this is what Paul is professing. This is what Paul is confirming. Now he goes on to say in verse 7, but made himself of no reputation. If you go to the Greek, it literally states, Paul emptied himself. Eskenosin, emptied himself. And, and I don't have a problem with this translation, made himself of no reputation. But this is to state, what is Paul saying here? He laid aside his glory, his pomp, his power. He laid all these things, his splendor. He laid them aside. Why? Because he took on the form of a bondservant and coming and the likeness of men. Being found in appearance of a man, as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Paul details here something very important regarding Yeshua. And that is that he was eternally preexistent. We understand this through Paul's statement that Yeshua humbled himself. He made himself of no reputation. He emptied himself. He took on a form of a bondservant. We see that in this. Now think about this for a minute. If Yeshua were born just a man, as their Unitarian friends challenge or allege, because Unitarians believe that Yeshua only came into existence upon conception in Miriam's womb. That's what they believe. Well, if that was the case then he couldn't have emptied himself because he would have been born a man. He was just born a man. There's no emptying, there's no humbling going on. You with me? Now, having said this, and, and Paul talking about, about the fleshly aspects of Yeshua, why was Yeshua manifest in the flesh? Well, the writer of Hebrews tells us this in Hebrews 2.14. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Verse 17, listen. Therefore, in all things he had to be made like his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted. He is able to aid those who are tempted. So Yeshua had to enter into his own creation to conquer sin and death. He had to enter into his, uh, his, the fallen race of mankind so that he could literally be a faithful high priest so that he could literally experience what we experience in the flesh, what we go through. We go through trials, through tribulations, temptations, right? He had to experience all these things. And listen, he goes on, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 4, verse 15 states, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, and yet without sin. The whole point of Yeshua coming in the flesh was for our sakes. It was for us. This is a story of love. It's a story of compassion, of forgiveness, of bearing one another's burdens. 
He experienced everything we have. We do not have a high priest that cannot sympathize with us. He knows what we're going through. And God so much loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that we might be redeemed. Redeemed back to him. This is why he had to come in the flesh. And I would like to point out here that we find that what we what we're just talked about, this isn't a new concept. Okay, It's not a new concept. We actually find this concept in the Hebrew Bible. It alludes to this very thing of Yeshua being tempted, having to be tempted in all points as we are. Look at what Isaiah says. It's a prophecy of Yeshua. Chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin, the Alma, shall conceive and bear a son. And you shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, literally we know this to mean God with us. The virgin was to conceive, bear a son who is called God with us. Now listen to this. Curds and honey he shall eat that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. He had to experience what it's like to be in a man of flesh with all the lusts and seductions that our flesh constantly craves. He had to experience this that he might know what it's like to refuse the evil and choose the good. And the writer of Hebrews picks up on this very passage, this very prophecy in Isaiah, and he states, Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. I want you to understand something. The writer of Hebrews is not saying Yeshua was rebellious like our children. We, he had to learn obedience. It's nothing like that. He learned obedience in that he learned what it was like to refuse the evil and choose the good. Now, I want to get back to Paul in his commentary to Philippians. We're going to continue. We'll reread verse 7 and 8. But he made himself of no reputation. He emptied himself taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Verse 9, Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Yeshua every knee should bow, those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth. Now here, Paul reveals that Yeshua's name, it's above every name. And it's at this name, the name of Yeshua, that every knee should bow. I'd like to point out here that it's not limited to those who are on earth or even under earth. It includes those who are in heaven. Okay? In other words, every living, breathing creature in the universe. This is a mere statement of Revelation 5 where we find literally stating although every creature in heaven, on earth, and under the earth cry out, blessing, glory, honor, and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. It's the very same thing that that Paul is drawing our attention to here. This is heavenly worship. That's my point. This is heavenly worship. True worship that is due only to the creator of heaven and earth. And yet it is given to one name, Yeshua. There's an interesting story in the, New, in the Old Testament found in the book of Genesis, and it ties this together. It's a passage that mysteriously alludes to the fact that Yeshua would receive such worship. In other words, there's testimony in the Tanakh already talking about this before it ever happened, to testify, to confirm. It's the story of Joseph. And for those of you who have never read about Joseph or studied his life, Joseph's life in many, many ways was a foreshadow of Yeshua's life. Let me give you a couple examples. And in this, you're going to see why I'm showing you these things. Number one, we find in Genesis 37, Joseph, he begins to have dreams. He's given a first dream about sheaves. And in this dream, he sees 11 sheaves. His sheaves rise above the other eleven, and the eleven sheaves bow down to his sheaf. Well, Joseph decides to tell his brothers about this dream. They didn't take so kindly because they understood it that, hey, are you saying that you're going to rise above us 
and that we're going to bow before you? And the text says they hated him. Interestingly enough, as we fast forward in the New Testament, this is exactly what we find. Yeshua's brothers hated him. Exact same thing. Well, so we have this first dream. Joseph is given another dream. This time, it's a little bit different. This time, it's celestial in nature. The sun, the moon, the 11 stars, they all bow down to Joseph. Every one of them. I want you to see something here. I want you to, this is not a coincidence. The first dream carries earthly imagery. Chiefs coming out of the earth. The second one is celestial in the heavens. You following me here? Because this is, this is talking about everyone that is in heaven and on earth will bow before him. And here we see they're bowing before Joseph. A shadow, a picture of the coming Mashiach. Secondly, we find Joseph, he is sold. He is betrayed by his own brothers for silver. 20 pieces of silver. Fast forward to the New Testament, Yeshua is betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Then we find that when they sold him and they betrayed him, they ended up taking his beautiful garment, a garment which his father gave him, that set him apart from the rest of his brothers. A beautiful color garment, a garment of many colors. His brothers took that garment, dipped it in blood to show his father that he has been killed. This gets really fascinating when you consider it wasn't the blood of just any animal. The animal that was killed was none other than a kid of the goats. Coincidence? I think not. When you look at Yom Kippur, what is killed to atone for the entire nation of Israel? A kid of the goats. This is the very thing that's used in the Pesach sacrifice. Remember, the Pesach sacrifice could be taken from the sheep or a kid of the goats. It's amazing imagery here for us. And then, and then you look at the fact that they dipped it in blood. Go to Revelation 19. We find Yeshua wears a robe dipped in blood. Then we find Joseph. Potiphar takes him under his wing. He starts serving the Egyptian Potiphar. But Joseph does something amazing. He endures temptation. Potiphar's wife had, was trying to seduce him, but Joseph overcame temptation. And what was his reward? He got locked up in prison. What was Yeshua's reward for overcoming all the temptations and trials? He was crucified. Interestingly enough, when Joseph was sent to prison, he was set over two others. Two men, a baker and a butler. Both of these men have dreams. Joseph interprets these dreams, tells the butler, you will be restored back to Pharaoh. Tells the baker, you're going to lose your head. Fast forward to the New Testament, Yeshua is crucified between two criminals. One is restored back to the Father. The other blasphemes Yeshua. He's lost. Now, Joseph, he gets out of prison because what he does is he interprets Pharaoh's two dreams, which are really one, but he interprets these dreams for Pharaoh. So Joseph rises out of prison to be second only to Pharaoh, where you find Yeshua rising out of the grave to sit at the right hand of the Father. It's amazing. Now this is what we read when he comes out. This is, this is where we're really going to get to the point of why I'm showing you all of this. Genesis 41, 38. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is, one, uh, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. Now you have to see the imagery here that foreshadows Yeshua. Here we find Pharaoh, who is ruler over, he is the ruler commander over all of Egypt. Nobody higher. 
And keep in mind, Egypt represents what? It represents this world, this age. So Pharaoh literally gives all authority to Joseph concerning his kingdom. And as we already covered in John 16, what did Yeshua say? All things that the Father has are mine, right? And what about John 5.22? The Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. We see the imagery. This is the confirmation. We're looking at this. This was pre-told. This was foretold of, of Yeshua. That's the point of this story. We continue in verse 41. Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand, put it on Joseph's hand, and he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. Pharaoh taking the signet ring off of his own hand, putting it on Joseph's hand, this is quite significant. It bears great meaning. And that the signet ring was the official seal of Pharaoh. It symbolized authority and power. Official documents were executed by the stamping or the sealing of the signet ring. And it was this ring that was, it would literally bear the name of Pharaoh. The signet ring would bear the name of... It was his official signature. And yet, that signet ring was given to Joseph in the same manner that we see all authority and power is given to Yeshua. Now we go on in verse 43. And he had him ride, Pharaoh had Joseph ride, in the second chariot which he had, and they cried out before him, Bow the knee. So he set him over all the land of Egypt. So we have Joseph's dreams, right? You have, you have his family, you have Israel bowing down before him. Celestial imagery. And now we see Joseph in this chariot going out over Egypt, which represents this entire world, and they cry out, bow the knee to Joseph. This is amazing. I think this is amazing imagery. Did we just lose something? Okay. Um, amazing imagery that foreshadows all about Yeshua. So getting back to Paul's commentary in, in verse 9. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him, given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Yeshua every knee should bow, of those in heaven, those on earth, and those under heaven the earth. Again, this statement demands worship. A worship that is only due to God and God alone. Now, I want to take this passage to another level. I want to start drawing some parallels for you between the name of Yeshua and the name Yahweh. The Tetragrammaton, the sacred name of God in the Old Testament. Because I want to show you that, biblically speaking, these two names, and yes, you are going to hear me correctly, Yeshua, Yahweh, they are transposable terms. Let me show you this. And we're going to begin with the prophet Joel. Because this is, this is a profound statement to make. Joel says this, And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of Yahweh, yod heh vav -Heh, shall be saved. I want to read that again. Whoever calls on the name of Yahweh shall be saved. This is the testimony, biblical testimony. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant who the Lord calls. Now, I want to show you how the apostles understood this name Yahweh. I didn't put these up here, but if you look at the Apostle Paul, in Romans chapter 10, he quotes this verse of Yeshua. Of Yeshua. You go to Acts chapter 2, Peter quotes this verse. Again, of one, of Yeshua. And going into Acts 4, we find Peter saying this. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if this day we are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Yeshua HaMashiach of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here 
before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Verse 12, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Joel tells us that whoever calls upon the name of Yahweh will be saved. And here we see Peter stating that only in the name of Yeshua will man receive salvation. There's salvation in no other. It is by that name and that name alone that we can be saved. Is there a discrepancy here? No. There is an association here. There is an identification here. There is a revelation here, if you will. The apostles associate the name Yahweh with Yeshua. They see them as one. Achad. And think about, I, I want to show you something by the Apostle Paul. Because really what the Apostle Paul is doing in this Philippians passage that I'm showing you, he is trying to bring this to light to us, to show us the association of Yahweh and Yeshua. And let me further prove it by Paul's own words. He goes on, That at the name of Yeshua every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth. Verse 11 and that every tongue should confess that Yeshua HaMashiach is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Did you know that Paul is quoting Scripture here verbatim? It's very interesting the way he quotes it, though. It's one little minor difference. Let me read to you the passage that he's quoting. He's quoting Isaiah 45:23. And this is the Lord speaking. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that to me, this is Yahweh speaking, to me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall take an oath. Shava, meaning to swear, to confess. This is the very passage that the Apostle Paul quotes, only he uses the name Yeshua. Clearly, Paul expresses his understanding of Yeshua's divine nature. He's revealing it to us. Yeshua wasn't just a man. He is Lord and God because he is one with his Father. Now, I want to take this even another step further. Did you notice what Paul states here in verse 11? Let me put it up here. That every tongue should confess that Yeshua HaMashiach is Lord. Paul calls for all to confess that Yeshua is Yahweh. That is what he is calling for here. Let me explain. The word used here for Lord in the Greek is none other than kurios. Kurios. Did you know that in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, the way Yahweh, yod heh vav -Heh, is rendered, this very word, it's rendered every time as kurios. The sacred name of Yahweh in the Greek Septuagint, the Jewish text, the Hellenistic text, is rendered kurios. I think that is pretty amazing. This tells us, Paul is stating here something. We're all to confess that Yeshua is Yahweh. It's the very confession that we see Thomas making in John chapter 20. My Lord and my God. Kurios. This is, um, this is the very term that is attributed to uh, Yeshua in the, um, in the New Testament. Sorry, lost my train of thought. It's the very term attributed to Yeshua in the New Testament. And what I want to do is I want to draw your attention to some scholarship on this. I want to go to some resource on here. And this is by a scholar known as Dr. Richard Longnecker. He's a distinguished professor of the New Testament. And he gives a commentary on this very passage in his uh, Christology of Early Jewish Christianity. And this is what he says. Listen to what he says. What name is this that is above every name? Undoubtedly, it is the name by which God himself has been known. That is, in Greek, kurios. 
Or perhaps it would be truer to early Jewish Christian thought to say that since Yeshua is the name of God, did you get that? Yeshua is the name Yahweh. This is what he's saying. Evidencing the presence and power of God, it is appropriate that the Old Testament title for God be his as well. This is mind-blowing. Yeshua is Lord and God. The Apostle Paul knew this. This is what he stresses. He labored hard to express this. The New Testament labors hard to express this. I'm going to close with this verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3. Paul says, Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Yeshua accursed or anathema in the Greek. No one can say that Yeshua is kurios except by the Ruach HaKodesh. Think about how profound that statement is. No one can make that statement. No one would make that statement that Yeshua is truly Yahweh unless they are anointed with the Ruach HaKodesh in their heart. Amen? Shabbat Shalom. We're going to end here.